I want to thank Seth and Reagan for that uh, message and song and for leading us in worship. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I want to invite you to open it to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, and part of the sermon is going to sound a little bit like the last sermon I preached in January, and, uh, but we're going to take it just a step further. In January, I preached from Mark chapter 1, and the bulletin is not wrong. The scripture we're going to use for this morning's text is Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. But what I want to do is I want us to tiptoe through and walk very quickly through the events that take place that lead us up to Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So if you've got your Bibles and you want to follow along, um, I'm going to be paraphrasing, and we're going to try to hit all of those events that take place. Mark opens up this book by saying in verse 1, this is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus the Messiah, God's Son. And the beginning of the ministry of Jesus the Messiah, God's Son, really begins before Jesus is on the scene with his ministry beginning, because God is preparing the way. And so Mark quotes Isaiah the prophet, who wrote this some 600 years before it actually happened. And so I want us to think about this for just a moment. 600 years ago, Isaiah wrote this, and you're one of the men there with Jesus, and you get to see it lived out in real time. How incredible would that be? It talks about there's going to be a voice in the wilderness calling, and, and, and that's what Isaiah said was going to happen. And then Mark says, John the Baptist did come. And he preached a message of repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sin. And while he's preaching, people are, his popularity is growing and growing, and people get him a little mixed up thinking maybe he's he's Jesus, and he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. The one that's coming behind me is much greater than me. I'm not worthy to bend down and untie his sandals. And then Jesus comes to Mark. Alex, will you put the map up here? Got a little map I want to use throughout this morning's message. It's not as big of a map as I would like to have had, but it'll do. Uh, This is going to be kind of where we're parked for this morning's message. If you were to go further south, you would see the the Jordan River flowing from the Sea of Galilee, and right about here on the map, there would be the Dead Sea. And just north of the Dead Sea, between those two, is the area they think John the Baptist was proclaiming this message of repentance and, and baptism for the forgiveness of sins. It's where Jesus himself goes, and John's like, I can't baptize you, man. You're you're the Messiah. And he's like, you've got to baptize me to fulfill Scripture. And so he baptizes him there. And then it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit to the wilderness, and that he was tempted by Satan. So if we've got the Dead Sea, and I apologize, but if it was here, the wilderness would be just a little bit south and west of, of the Dead Sea. And so Jesus spends 40 days in this area, fasting, not eating, but praying, and he's in this spiritual battle because Satan comes along, and he tempts Jesus in three major ways, and he uses God's Word. But Jesus uses God's Word too. And whenever the Satan would say, but if you'll do this and use God's Word, if you remember, Jesus would say, but it is also written, and therefore I shouldn't do what you say to do, because then I would be sinning. And that ends with it saying that Jesus was there for 40 days, he was among the wild animals, and the angels attended to him. Right after that, we learn that John has been thrown in prison, and Jesus himself begins to proclaim the good news. The kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is near. Repent. And so he goes through this area. Uh, The Sea of Galilee is obviously there. To the west of the Sea of Galilee, that whole region there is the Galilean region. And so Jesus goes through the region of Galilee preaching and proclaiming the good news. And when he's on the shore of Galilee one day, he runs into two brothers, Simon and Andrew, and he asks them to follow him, just to give up everything and follow me. Be my disciple. Learn from me. They give up, they give up their careers, they give up their families, and they go follow Jesus. And not far from there, they run into two other brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and Jesus requests them as the same, come follow me. They leave their dad in the boat with the hired hands tending the nets, and they go to follow Jesus. When the Sabbath day comes along, the the day that God said in the Ten Commandments to remember it and to keep it holy, all activity, as everyone knows it, ceased. Because God created the world in six days, and he said on the seventh, I rested, you should rest, you should remember me, and remember the things about me. So on the Sabbath day... Back to the map at the very top, it's a little bit unclear, but it says Capernaum. Capernaum was on the top north 
western point of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus goes to the Sabbath, and he is discipling these men. He is teaching them, we're going to obey the laws, because that's what disciples do. And Jesus goes there, and he begins to preach. And as he's preaching, everyone is blown away. They are amazed at his teaching. It is so unlike the teachers of the law. And while they're there in that gathering, if you remember, he cleanses a man with an impure spirit. It was an amazing day at church that day. And it says at the very end of it, and I get a little bit tickled because it says, and the news about Jesus spread throughout Galilee. And it's like, you think? <laughs> there wasn't CNN, there wasn't Fox News, there wasn't Twitter, there was no Facebook, there was no Snapchat, there was no texting, there was no telephone, telegraph. But there was teleperson. And they told this person, and that person, and that person, and that person. They leave the uh, synagogue, they go to Andrew and Simon's home, when they get there, they find out that Simon's mother-in-law is sick and Jesus heals her. He, he, he heals her from having a fever. She waits on them later that day. At sunset, after the Sabbath is over and everybody is free to go back to their normal activities, they weren't constricted by how far they could walk or travel. At sunset, it says that the whole town came to their house and Jesus healed many with sicknesses and illnesses and he cast out demons and impure spirits. They get up the next morning and it says that Jesus got up. It was still dark. He left the house. He went to a secluded place so that he could pray. Now, after all of this activity, <laughs> it'd be some time for prayer, wouldn't it? He needs to reconnect back to God. As the members of the house wake up, they don't see Jesus, and they go looking for him, and they can't find him, and they finally do. They find him praying. And Jesus doesn't snap back at him like, leave me alone, I'm trying to pray here, what's wrong with you? He just says, we need to get ready to go. I need to go to the other towns and villages and preach and proclaim the good news, because that's why I came. And so, back to the map, to the, to the west of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus goes into that region to the towns and villages proclaiming the good news and preaching to everyone. While he's there, in the last few verses of chapter 1, he is approached by a man that has a disease called leprosy. It was a flesh-decaying terminal disease. You will not recover from, from leprosy. Uh, in that day, there was no cure for it. He was doomed. His life was over. He was what they call a dead man walking. And he asked Jesus, if you're willing, he begs him, cleanse me. Jesus looks on him with compassion. Jesus says, I'm willing be clean. I can't imagine the joy that went through that man's mind and how he looks at his flesh and it becomes whole immediately. Jesus also warns him though, see to it that you tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and then offer the sacrifices according to the law of Moses and let that be a testimony to you being clean. But the Bible says the man went and he began to talk freely and openly with everyone about him being clean and what Jesus had done for him. The fame of Jesus was so great that it says he could no more openly or freely go into the towns and villages because of all of the crowds. And it's like, man, we were like choked that guy with leprosy that got healed. You know, how dare him? Jesus just healed. But I want to tell you something. I want you to think about this. If you had a terminal illness and you were healed from it, it'd be pretty hard to shut up about it, wouldn't it? But as a result, Jesus has to go to these secluded, desolate places, and wherever he goes, the people follow Jesus. End of chapter 1. Alex, if you will, let's, let's, let's go through the Scripture. We're going to read this together. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him, or since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. 
Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, Get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Just a few days after Jesus heals the man with leprosy, this terminal illness, he can't go anywhere. So he goes back to Capernaum, back to the home of Simon and Andrew. They're going to try to probably regroup. They're probably going to try to say, okay, now where do we go from here? He doesn't arrive with any fanfare, and I would imagine that if given the chance, he would have probably put on sunglasses and a hoodie and try to just stroll through town and not be seen. But they find out where Jesus is (laughs) when they learn that he was in the house. So many people came to that house that there was no more room in the house. There was no way to get in and out of the door. And the crowd went way beyond the house. As far as people could hear Jesus, they were standing there listening. Now, this doesn't seem so unusual to us that Jesus would just begin preaching. But I want you to think about this. If you're at home and this big crowd shows up, and and, um, women, I'm not being a chauvinist, but you're probably going to be wondering, how are we going to feed all these people? How long are they going to stay? Do we have enough toilet paper in the bathroom? Do we have enough tea? Do we have enough lemonade? Man, what about the water supply? And Andrew and Simon, you know, if I were them, I'd be like, man, you guys are messing up the house. Get rid of them. And if I were Jesus, after doing all of that, what would I want to do? I'd probably like, get out. Leave me alone for just a few minutes. At least give me a day, okay? But what does Jesus do? He begins to preach. It's like, well, we don't have anything better to talk about, do we? No, really, is there anything, and that's what I want to lay with you for now. I just want you to have this in the back of your mind. What better do we have to talk about? This week, while you're at work, or while you and a bunch of buddies are hanging around, or a bunch of you girls are talking, whether it's at school, or whether you're, you're at your job, in your cubicle, or whatever, pay attention to what everybody's talking about. I'll bet you they're talking about some computer program, some phone app, what was on Facebook, what was on Twitter, the fuel mileage that they wish they could get or they don't get, the new truck they'd like to have, the the new whatever. We'll talk about the weather, we'll talk about the president, we'll talk about the nukes, we'll talk about North Korea. It's endless, but when's the last time you stopped somebody in a crowd and said, I want to share with you what God's done for me? Think about that. Jesus begins to preach. And all the time that's going on, There's something else going on. There's a group of men. We don't know how big the group is, but there's a group of men. And within that group of men, there are five of them, four, that are carrying a mat or a cot or a mattress. And on that mattress is this man who is paralyzed, meaning he can't fully move. We're not sure if it's from the waist down or from the mat down. But these four men are on a mission. They're trying to get their friend to Jesus. And let's put ourselves in their shoes for just a moment. They know that Jesus is in some house in Capernaum. I don't know if they came across the whole region of of Galilee or if they're just going across the street or across town. But they're trying to get their friend to this house where they know they've heard that Jesus is. This might be the only opportunity that they have because at any given moment, Jesus can release the crowd and they go. And it's going to be hard to catch up with Jesus, isn't it? There's, there's no side-by-side, there's no four-wheeler, there's no truck to throw him on, and we're going to go, best shot you got is a camel with a little strap thing to, to hold him on or a donkey, but that's going to be pretty hard to do with your little group of guys, isn't it? And this man, if you've ever tried to help somebody who can't move, it's a job. They're on their way to this house with their friend to get them to the only man on the whole planet that might have a chance to do something to make his life different and better. Probably not too hard to find. You're in downtown Crittenden. You're looking for a house in Crittenden. This house has a ginormous group of people surrounding it. That's probably the house. 
as they go. One man on each corner carrying this mat. One man on the mat who can't move. When they arrive at the house, it's it's going to be a lot harder to get him to Jesus than they really thought. As they approach the house, they see the crowd. It's, it's too deep. You can't move. The man on the mat, probably nobody there cares for him. He has nothing to offer for society. They just deem him as, as helpless and really useless, and nobody's probably going to get out of the way to let him through. They are so intent on listening to what Jesus has to say, they may not even turn around when they tap him on his shoulder. And so they probably have to set him down and walk around the house and say, is there a back door? Is there a side window? How can we get him in this house? Alex? We got for you a first century replication of a possible house in downtown on the shores of the Sea of Galilee house. It's a one story. They would build the walls and then they would put beams across these walls to hold the roof structure. And across those beams they would crisscross it maybe with uh, branches or other pieces of wood. And on top of that there would be another a layer of tile and possibly a second layer of tile. And on top of that they would put the mud and the clay and they would pack that in really tight so that water couldn't penetrate it. It would have a set of steps up the side of it like you see there to give you access to the roof. Nobody was on the roof because when you're on the roof you can't hear Jesus speaking down below and you can't see what's going on down below. And so these guys do what a group of guys will do. They come up with an idea. <laughs> They would use the roof much like we would a deck or a porch. They would probably hang out up there for a private moment. It would be a great, thing, great place to go on a quiet morning with a cup of coffee and to read God's Word or have time of prayer. Maybe have a birthday party up there, a celebration. You could get, get away from all the noise that was on the street and in the house. Let's go to the roof. I know. We'll take him up on the roof. We'll dig through the dirt and we'll lower him in front of Jesus. That's how we'll get him there. Hey, guys, great idea, right? And the gals are going, yeah, that sounds like the boneheaded idea that my guy would come up with. But guess what? They have no other choice. There's no other option, and this may be the only opportunity that they have. Now, I want you to write this down if you've got a pencil or pen and you've got the sermon notes. What these guys did, they did something when they did this that was difficult. Have you ever tried to move furniture up and down steps with four guys? let alone somebody on a mat that you don't want to fall off, and he may be, maybe he can't hold on. It was difficult to get him up those steps. It was probably difficult to dig through this mud roof because it's compacted to where the water won't penetrate it. It's compacted enough to hold everybody up on top of it, and you've got to dig a hole in it in such a way that it doesn't cave in and you don't go flying down into the hole in front of the whole crowd. So what they did was difficult. What they did was unusual. Have you ever seen anybody like peel back the metal of this and let somebody down? When's the last time you've heard anybody go to this unusual type of a thing to get somebody to Jesus? It was difficult. It was unusual. It was also costly. It cost them time. It cost them probably resources. And it may have cost them some money to repair that roof when they were done. You've got to figure out where Jesus is in the house because what if you dig the hole and there's the kitchen? You've got to dig again. Or, well, there wouldn't have been an indoor bathroom, but I'm just saying. So they dig the hole. They let their friend down right in front of Jesus. Mission accomplished. Can you imagine? You've dug the hole. You've lowered your buddy. You're down. And, and you know, if you've gone all this distance to get Jesus, or to get your friend in front of Jesus, you're going to be leaning in. I want to hear it. What's he going to say? Is it going to be abracadabra, hocus pocus? Is he going to say paralysis gone? Is he going to say get up, take your mat and go? What's Jesus going to say? Well, what Jesus had to say, I think, blew everybody away. And I think the guys up on the roof, if it would have been me, <laughs> there would be a little bit of me, what Jesus said next, that would be kind of disappointing. But I want you to think about what Jesus sees before what he says. Does he see the man and that he's, that he's helpless or that he's paralyzed? That's not what he sees first. Does he see a hole in the roof and say, what are you doing? He doesn't say that he even notices that. When Jesus sees their faith, then he says, son. There have been some people in the crowd that day that have been blown away for Jesus to refer to this man as one of his own, as his son, because... 
Well, he was paralyzed, so there was some sin in this man's life that made him paralyzed or his family's life. You're calling him son, but Jesus does. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. Doesn't do much for us, does it? Probably for, the, for me, if I were the guy that dug the hole wanting Jesus to heal my friend, and he says, your sins are forgiven. I'm going to be honest. That had been a big part of me that had been let down. That's not what we brought him here for. That's not why we came. But there were others in the crowd that had some other thoughts going on, not necessarily of the mind, but it says they were thinking in their heart. This had an emotional attachment to it. They were thinking in their hearts, why does he say that? That's blasphemy. No one can forgive sins but God and God alone. And Jesus knew in his spirit exactly what they were thinking. And so Jesus has some questions of his own. Why are you thinking what you're thinking? What would be easier for me to say that your sins are forgiven or get up and take this mat and go home? Now before you answer, I want you to consider this. If Jesus wasn't God and he said your sins are forgiven, it really would be blasphemy. And you know what the punishment for blasphemy is? It's death by stoning. So, it wouldn't be all that easy to necessarily say. Now, the other thing that I think it would be easy to say your sins are forgiven. Zach, I'm going to use you, okay? If I say, Zach, your sins are forgiven, it's not like he's going to turn purple all of a sudden and we see the difference in him, are we? No. But if you're paralyzed... And I say, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, you see the difference in this person's life, right? But there's a flip side. If I say, get up, take your mat, and go home, and you don't get up, you can't. Well, number one, I'm going to look like, Jesus is going to look like the biggest idiot in the whole crowded house in front of all these people. Number two, it's going to be very... um, I just lost the word. It's going to be mean. It's going to be torturistic for this guy who maybe all of his life or a big part of it has wanted nothing more than to get up and grab the mat and go. But Jesus says, so that you know that I have the authority to forgive sin on earth, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he gets up, and he grabs his mat, And the crowd that kind of kept him from getting to Jesus, I can just see them like parting, okay, let the guy go, because now he can walk again. But let's think about this action of him getting up. Most of us, even if we don't have children, we've been around children when they're learning to walk, they crawl up to your pant leg, they pull you up, and then boom. And then maybe they let go and they take a couple, and then boom, and they wobble and they bobble. And thank God they bounce. This man gets up. He has full strength in his legs. He has full flexibility. There's no wobble, there's no bobble, there's no fall down, get up and go again. Matter of fact, he's even got his balance to bend over, pick up a mat and go. He is totally 100% forgiven and healed. Can I get an amen out of that? Wow. What's everybody thinking? Well, if you're up on the roof, it's got to be high fives, chest bumps, a wink, a nod, a what We did it, man! Look at that! He's healed! Wow! I can't imagine the immense emotion that these people had. I would be running down the steps, running for the front door. We would be a great embrace, like none other. Can you imagine? So, the people there, it says, were amazed and they praised God because they had never seen anything like this. I'm going to ask Seth and Reagan to come back up here for our invitation hymn. And as they do, maybe you're here and you are like the paralyzed man. You need to meet Jesus. You need to allow him to take care of this sin problem that you have, because we all have a sin problem. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, you don't have the authority over my sin problem. (laughs) If you only knew my sin problem. You know what? 
Maybe there's a reason it doesn't tell us what this man's sin problem was. He could have been paralyzed at birth and been very bitter and angry, blaming God. Maybe somebody caused him to be paralyzed and he had this unforgiving spirit. How dare they take my mobility away, my job away, my family away, my way of life away. Could have been none of those. Maybe he just had a lust problem or maybe, maybe in his heart he, he had hatred for whatever reason. We don't know. But if Jesus had the authority over his sin problem, he's got authority over every one of our sin problems, whatever they are. In a second, in a moment, we're going to stand and sing. And we want to invite you, if you need to come to Jesus, I want to encourage you to do so. Maybe you've already had Jesus take care of your sin problem. Well, this isn't over for you either. Because every one of us in this room knows somebody who has a sin problem that need to meet and to come to Jesus. And just like those four men, well, there's something all of us can do. Are you ready and prepared tomorrow, or maybe this afternoon, when you're around somebody who needs to meet Jesus, to do something that might be difficult? Man, sometimes it's, <laughs> it's just not easy, is it? Maybe there's a conversation that you need to have with this person that's not going to be easy. Maybe there's a, a cup of coffee that you need to drink with them, and it's going to be difficult. Are you ready to do something that's unusual? Don't think just because I've invited them to church that's the normal thing we want to do. Well, that's okay. We want you to invite people to church. No doubt we're going to try to meet Jesus every time we, we gather. But let's not put God's will in this box of our thinking. There may be something like carrying somebody up the steps, tearing open a roof. You might have to do something that's costly. Maybe there's a lunch you have to buy. Maybe that difficult conversation, you're afraid and terrified that it's going to cost you the relationship. But I want to encourage you to be thinking about that person, the difficulty, the unusual, and the costly thing that you might have to do. Because if you can get them to Jesus, it's going to be amazing. We're going to praise God, no doubt. But the Bible is very clear that when a sinner comes to repentance and comes to the Lord, all of heaven rejoices. If you have a decision to make, we want to invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. But I want to encourage you this week, go do the difficult, do the unusual, if it takes that, and do the costly. There have been enough people tragically lose their lives here in the recent month. And I'm not trying to be morbid, and I'm not trying to scare anybody. But I think we all got a pretty good idea that we never know. This might be the only opportunity that any of us have. Let's stand and sing.